morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to our service this morning on this rather damp and dreary autumn morning. It's good to have you in church to worship God this morning. Um, also, to all of you watching online or listening to the service, you too are very welcome. And I, I can assure you all, you're very much part of our church family in these difficult and unusual times we're living in at this minute in time. Uh, this morning, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, along James Livingstone, who's taking the service with Jonathan this morning. Uh, James, good to have you back with us. Uh, some of you recall James took a service last year in the evening service, so it's good to have James back with us this morning. And thank you very much, James, for coming along this morning. Uh, announcements are very few and far between at this time of the year. I just one announcement I want to make. Uh, you'll be aware of the midweek uh, this Wednesday evening, 8 p.m., so please uh, tune into that. Uh, you can watch online or listen to through the telephone service. That's all the announcement I want to say. I think uh, Mark wants to make a wee announcement about Sunday school here, so just call upon Mark Walker up to the restaurant this time. Thank you. Just a quick um, announcement from, sun from Sunday school. So it's good to see a few young, young people with us uh, here this morning. Um, any that are and have missed it, we've got uh, packs um, here at the door just for you to pick up. So one for the younger children in purple and another activity Bible uh, for the, for the older, older children. Um, so Sunday school, obviously, as you know, is going to have to change a little bit just with the current restrictions. So with that, with that in mind, um, from, uh, from next week, we're hoping to, at a from a quarter past 10, run a Zoom uh, meeting. So a quarter past 10 until a quarter to 11. Um, so hopefully from the comfort of your own home, um, you'll be able to join, join with us. It's going to be, allow us then to follow a similar format uh, to what we do in Sunday school over in the hall traditionally. So we'll have um, our quizzes, we're going to have songs that we wouldn't be able to do in the hall. Um, and um, you'll be able to move, or, move around. And then again, we'll link in the story and the quiz to these workbooks. Um, so if you're then coming out to church later on in the morning, you can grab your work uh, book and you can work through it then in the, in the, in the ser sermon because, as you're also aware, there's no uh, child children's church uh, going on at this, at this time. Um, again, just put your name, just so that we keep the same book each week, uh, just put your name onto the front of the folder and then put it into one of the boxes at the two doors as, as, you, as you leave. Um, again, very aware, however, that at this time... Um, it, not everyone's going to be coming out, uh, not every family and not every young person. So let me know, get in contact with me via the church uh, email address and I'll make sure that I can get these to your, to your home so that again, after the Zoom meeting ends, you can just work along in the comfort of your own home uh, on, these, on these packs. So whether you're worshipping um, from home or here in the church, um, after Sunday school, you're still very, very much a part of um, a part of the Sunday school and a part of the church uh, community and the learning that's, go that's going on. And yeah, just to say thank you to all the parents and all of the many people here that are praying for the young people, uh, praying for the Sunday school. It's changed times for everyone, particularly as we're well aware for, for, our, for, our, for our young people. And um, yeah, just keep that, keep that outreach uh, on, on, on going. And um, just to thank you guys for all your prayer and support that you're giving to the Sunday school and to the many other organisations. I know the BB and Youth Fellowship, they are now up and running. Uh, vir virtually um, as, as well. So we'll see how that works over the month of October. Give some feedback to, to us leaders, um, both parents and from, directly from the young people. And then if we need to change it, we'll, we'll do just that. Uh, we just need to be fluid at these times and we'll work to whatever works best uh, for, for, the, for the young people of our, of our con congregation. And that's everything for me. So I'll hand over to James. Thank you. I wasn't quite sure which James he was handing over to, but I, I'll assume it's this one uh, for the now. Well, can I add my welcome, and it's good to be here and join with you as we worship God together in these different times, and yet uh, we can indeed come together to worship our God. Uh, the psalmist writes, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation Day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. 
Gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we come into your presence on this your day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that right way back at creation, you created all things in six days, pronouncing them very good. And then as a pattern for us, you set apart that one day of rest and recreation. A day special, a day holy unto you. And so that is why we have come today. And also we have come because on this first day of the week, we are reminded that our Savior rose triumphant over death and over the power of death. And we have come as a company of your people into your house to worship you, the living and the true God, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come the one of whom the psalmist has reminded us this morning, you are a great God. You are the one who is only worthy to be praised. For you are the God above all gods. Indeed, there is no God like you. Uh, For you are the God, not only as we've been reminding ourselves of creation, but you are the God who sustains us. You are the God who gives us the very breath that we breathe. And so before this God, we bow. We submit ourselves this morning. Father, as we have come into your house and into your presence, may we have come to worship you. We come from our different homes and situations. We have many issues of life that concern us, particularly in these times. And yet, our God, as we have come, help us to set these things aside for this short time and concentrate upon you. Lord God, bless us as we read your word. Bless us as we consider it together. Bless us as we sing our praise. May all we do, may all we think, may all we say this day be to your honour and for your glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We read in God's word this morning and we find it in the Gospels, the Gospel according to St. John and the first chapter and we'll be reading the verses marked 19 to 34 John's gospel chapter 19 chapter 1 sorry and verse 19 now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was he did not fail to confess but confessed freely I am not the Christ they asked him then who are you are you Elijah he said I'm not Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing the next day. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Amen. And we pray God's blessing on this reading from his own holy and infallible word. I've been asked to say a a few words to the boys and girls here in the service. It's good to have you with us this morning. 
um, I don't know about your house, but uh, where, when my children were small and, and now with the grandchildren, um, once they came, came back to school uh, from the lockdown, uh, the, the shout you hear in the morning is, are you up yet? Are you up yet? And the, the grumble that comes from upstairs, Meh, which usually probably means no, um, but I'm thinking about it. Uh, and after a while, the, the shout goes up, are you up yet? It's time. You were at breakfast. It's time you were catching the school bus. It's time you were going to school. You see, whenever schools were in lockdown, well, school wasn't very far. You came down the stairs, or if you were in a bungalow, you walked to the next room, and that was school. So that was fine. But, but now you've got to go to school. And our lives seem to be ruled by this thing called time. So how do we measure time? Well, we measure it in seconds. I'm sure if I asked you, you could tell me the number of seconds in a, a minute, uh, the number of minutes in an hour, the number of hours in a day, and so on. But I've got some things with me this morning that help us to measure time. Now, the first one you may or may not have in your garden. Um, I, I doubt if you have it in your house, and it wouldn't be much good this morning, even if you do have one. Um, it's one of these. If you know what that is. Yeah. Anybody prepared to shout at me? I don't bite. Well, not often. Yeah. A sundial, yes. A sundial. And basically the premise of the sundial is the sun when it shines and it was shining. Was it shining? Yeah, it was shining certainly on Friday and Thursday. can't remember yesterday. Um, uh, but the sun when it shines... Uh, it, it shines on these metal pointers, and there you have the various hours, one, two, three, four, and so on. And you can tell the time, though it's probably not a particular, particularly accurate uh, sound. It doesn't give you the, 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 the minutes and the seconds, but it is a way of measuring time. And then we have the, the, the old-fashioned way, uh, a watch. Um, I, I, I always keep a watch. My wife says, why do you keep a watch in a pool? But you never use it. But I, 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 bring, it, I bring it with me anyway. The watch, uh, and that's another way of telling the time. Uh, nowadays, of course, people don't seem to use watches. They have things called Fitbits, whatever they are. And they tell you the time and so on as well. But I have a couple of other things here that help to tell the time. We have, we have two clock alarms uh, on my wife's side of the bed, mine, uh, but because we don't trust electricity in Crumlin, um, I also have one of these battery clocks, and that's, that's our alarm clock. And when we were, my wife was going, goes up a couple of days a week to look after granddaughters, she was getting up early in the morning, and this is actually set at five o'clock. Did you know there was such a, I only thought there was one five o'clock in a day, and that was around your tea time, but apparently there is another five o'clock in a day that farmers would know about uh, in the morning. Well, that's set at five o'clock a.m., though I hope it doesn't go up here. So an alarm clock is another way of telling the time. And then there's another thing that your mum might have, although she probably has a more up-to-date one than this one. This, this is a little timer, uh, which when, she's, when, when my wife's baking and she wants to, to, to know it's something to take in 35 minutes, uh, this wee tingle of it, she sets it and then it goes off and it reminds her if she's in a different room that she needs to go and, and take whatever it is out of the oven. And then one final thing, that, uh, believe it or not, is also a clock. Is, your, is a mobile phone. And on this one, like most of your mobile phones, there's a stopwatch. And so when my grandsons want to run a race and see who's quickest, I can set the stopwatch. So there are lots of ways and lots of different things that we have to tell the time. There is a book in the Bible, a book that you probably don't read all that often. It's a book, a book of Ecclesiastes. And the third chapter there talks about there being a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to uproot. We're around the harvest time now and harvest is being brought in, but then there'll be a time to plant, a time to tear, a time to mend, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time to hate. 
a time for peace. Time. But in, in the New Testament, in a book called Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 2, there is another little verse that says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That reminds us, you see, that God has given us time here on earth. For some people, it might be a short time. For some people, it might be a long time. But that time will come to an end. And so he wants us to use the time that we have now wisely. The psalmist says, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So when you use your watch, when you use your, your alarm clock or whatever it is you use to tell the time, remember that there's a time for everything, but there is a time more importantly when we need to come to the Lord Jesus and ask him to forgive us and to take away our sins. We're going to sing now together our praise this morning, how deep the Father's love for us. as we remember others before God's throne this morning. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we are found met in your house, we thank you for that wondrous love that we have been singing, the love of our Father God, the love that he so shared and showed to us by the sending of his only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into our world. How he gave his life there, a ransom for many. How he took the pain, the punishment that was due to us so that by his stripes we have been healed. 
And for our Father, as we are met this morning, we remember those who cannot be in your presence in your house here, those who are kept back through illness, those who are kept back for the care and concern of the elderly or of the young, those who are just anxious about coming together in public, who are meeting with us online or through telephone. And our God, we praise and we thank you that you are not restricted by time nor sense nor place so that where they are, they can receive that rich blessing that we can receive here in your house. And we do remember before you this morning the minister of this place and his wife at this time that you will undertake for him, that you will touch him, that you will completely restore him to good health and strength and bring him back to minister once more here among your people. And our God, we've been hearing about the work of of Sunday school and and BB and youth this morning and we pray for each organisation part of this congregation that you will bless those who teach and those who are taught. We pray for organisations such as PW who are finding it difficult at this time perhaps to to come together to meet because of the circumstances. We do pray your blessing upon each of them as in their own way they seek to serve you, uh, the living and the true God. Dear Father, we pray for our wider community for our presbytery as it meets on Tuesday evening, for our moderator, the Reverend McNeil, for the clerk, the Reverend Paul, for all who will gather, grant wisdom, grant understanding. We pray for those who are set in authority over us in Stormont, in Westminster. Uh, Father in heaven, these are difficult times. Grant to them wisdom, that wisdom that comes only from you, that they might seek not to please men, but rather that they might seek to please the one who is the living and the true God. So, Father, now continue with us, bless us, and do us good, we pray, as we turn to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder this morning, um, do you consider yourself to be someone who has a a left-sided brain or a right-sided brain? Apparently there is a difference, Um, I'm not quite sure which way round it is, mind you, but apparently those who are more one side than t'other, if you're left sided, let's call it, you're more mathematically orientated, uh, whereas if you're right sided, you're you're more orientated towards uh, linguistics or English or whatever that is. Um, Some people... I've met who are neither left-sided nor right-sided, and, and I, I don't know what that means. There are others who are so super brainy that they're both left-sided and right-sided. But I must say, if I have any preference, maybe it's because I'm worse at maths than English, that, then I prefer the English side of things. And so my, my son-in-law, who, who gets the, the newsletter, other newspapers are available, I'm told, um, he gets it on a Wednesday, on a Saturday. Those of you who are farmers will know why that is, because uh, it's got that farming news in it. Uh, but my wife brings it down, and then in the newsletter there are crosswords and there are Sudoku. So my wife, who's more orientated to Mars, does a Sudoku. I can't do it. Um, and I do the, the crosswords. But there's a little sparrow crossword, I'm sure some of you have seen it, which basically you get the meanings of words, there are four letter words, and then you fill in this spiral, and eventually across the middle, you get a, a word, a proper word, and I quite enjoy doing it. And it's about a word I want us to, to think this morning, and it's a word because you, like me, probably use the New International Version, it doesn't really appear. It appears in the King James Version that I was brought up and many of you were brought up on. Indeed, it appears in it, 1,326 times, and it is the word behold. Now, if you look at the dictionary and try to find out what the word behold means, it, it gives you options like stir, see, observe, view, watch, look. And all of these are, are true. These are all definitions of the word behold. And yet, they, they don't carry, I think, with it the same sense that the Bible does when it asks us 
to behold. Because when the Bible uses the word behold, it, it, it really wants us to, to do more than just a casual glance, a casual look. It wants us to, to gaze intently. It wants us to gaze with wonder. It, it wants us to gaze with respect at something or, or someone. Now, we read from John's Gospel this morning, and if you remember anything of that reading, you, you will recall that the word behold does not appear. But actually, in the King James Version, in John 1 and 29, and again at verse 37, John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. And that's the first behold I want us to think about this morning, the Lamb of God. And to think about this in terms of the Lamb which God provides. Now, now some of you will have, have sheep um, and lambs, and so you will know more about sheep and lambs than I do. But in, in the context in which John the writer here is writing, and he pens these words from John the Baptist, John has been preaching in the first part of this chapter about the need for repentance. And we read that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And so John would point people to their sins and they would say, well, John, what do you want us to do? What should we do? And then he would baptize them. But we read this morning that one day as he's doing this and, and they come to him and they say, well, who are you? What authority? What, what are you? Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? And of course, they wouldn't use the name Moses, but that's who they were referring to. Are you Moses? And he said, No, I'm not Moses. Well, are you the Messiah? And he said, No, I am not the Messiah. I am the forerunner, if you like. I'm the one who comes before the Messiah. But then, uh, as he preaches, one day he sees coming towards him. This figure, the Lord Jesus, and, and John points to him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, John could have used many titles. He could have said, Behold Jesus of Nazareth. He, he could have said, Behold, here is the promised one. He could have said, Behold, this is the Messiah. He could have said, Behold, this is the Son of God, the Son of Man the son of David. But instead of that, John says, behold, the Lamb of God. What did John mean when he described Jesus as being the Lamb of God? Well, Jesus, first of all, as the Lamb of God, was the perfect Lamb, the perfect Lamb. In the Old Testament, in Genesis 4 and 4, where sacrifice is first mentioned, you remember Cain and Abel brought their sacrifice one brought the lamb, the other brought the fruits of the field, and God was only willing and prepared to accept the offering of the sacrifice of the lamb. And then as you move on to Exodus 12 and 5, you read there the story of setting up of the Passover. And they were instructed, and this is the instruction, the animals you choose must be hero males without defect. The book of Leviticus and Leviticus 1 and 10 reiterates this requirement. The lamb had to be without spot and without blemish. Why was that? Well, it just meant that the farmer couldn't just go or the shepherd go out into the field and say, well, that's a dodgy looking lamb there. It's hind legs not too good or it's not putting on an awful lot of weight. I don't think it'll ever make anything of itself. I'll use that one. The sacrifice, to be a sacrifice, had to involve a cost. It had to be the best that there was, not just getting rid of the worst that there was. And so when God gave the offering, if you like, the sacrifice to satisfy his wrath, he gave the best that he had. He had to give one without spot, without defect. The one who was paying the price, paying the penalty for sin, had to be spotless, had to be sinless. So God gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he gives Jesus, he, 
he doesn't give one who is without, who has sin rather, but without sin. As true man, Jesus could die, but only as true God could he fulfill this requirement to be the perfect sacrifice. You remember when it gets to the trials of Jesus, and as he stands before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, what does Pilate conclude? He says, I find no fault in this man. Jesus was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. You remember when he dies on the cross, that Roman centurion, having seen everything, comes to this conclusion. Truly, he says, this was a righteous man. So Jesus can be the Lamb of God because he is perfect. The commentator Matthew Henry says, when, when, when John speaks of this Lamb, he speaks to us of gentleness, of innocence. He speaks to us of purity. He speaks to us of sweetness. He speaks to us of forgiveness. He speaks to us of meekness. And so Jesus was the perfect lamb. But secondly, as the lamb of God, it was propitiatory in function. That simply means that the sacrifice that Jesus offered was not for his sins but for the sins of others. You see, if Jesus was only dying for his own sins, then that would have been no benefit to the world, to you, to me, to anyone. But it is the Apostle Peter who reminds us that he bore in his body our sin up onto the tree, dying there, the just for the unjust, that he might reconcile us unto God. You see, we could not by our works of righteousness, which are in God's sight only but filthy rags, pay for our sins. Without the sharing of blood, or in other words, without sacrifice, there could be no forgiveness, no remission. And Jesus was able to fulfill that as the Lamb of God. But there is also a thought here about the people of the Lamb. You see, John goes on to say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And so some people say, Oh, there you go, you see. That means Jesus died for everybody. That means that everybody's going to heaven when they die. Uh, We often refer to that as universalism. Christ died for everyone. We, we read and we see signs as we go about the country. Christ died for the ungodly. We're all ungodly. That means Christ died for all of us. But clearly that is not in accordance with what Scripture teaches. Because it says those who come to Christ will not be turned away. But that means that there will be some who don't turn to, to Christ. It also says that it is those whom the Father gives to the Son who will be saved. That means that there are some that the Father does not give. You see, if it was otherwise, you remember the story that we have in Scripture of the rich man and Lazarus. And what happened? The rich man dies and goes to hell. Lazarus dies and goes to heaven. Well, if that wasn't the case, if everyone of Christ died for everyone then that makes a nonsense of the story that Christ told. Clearly, there are these two distinct groups. There are those who have sought the forgiveness of this Lamb of God and have their sins covered by the blood of this Lamb, and there are those who haven't and don't. And the key question for us in O.C. Randallstown and those who are watching by, uh, by means of social media this morning is which group Which group do we find ourselves in? Do we find ourselves in the group that are covered by the blood of this Lamb of God? Behold the Lamb of God. But there is a second behold that I want us to think about. And that's found in 1 John this time, chapter 1 and at verse 3, where we read this. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. If the Lamb speaks to us of the love, uh, it speaks to us of the, the Lamb of God, 
This text in 1 John speaks to us about the love which God proffers to us. John wants to set our gaze here on something, on someone different. Sometimes, you know, we we glibly talk about John 3 and 16, that God so loved the world. And more recently, I've been pondering on that text and what it actually means. You see, it means that the activity in the love was not ours, but the activity was God. We did not take the initiative in moving towards God, but God took the initiative in moving towards us. And what did he do? Well, out of his love for those who didn't love him, out of his love for those who rejected him, out of love for those who disobeyed him, who broke his commands, he so loved that he gave. You see, when it's our birthday, when it's Christmas, and we get a gift, It doesn't come with the price tag. Well, sometimes it does if the person forgets to take it off. Uh, But we don't get presented with a gift and a bill that says, that jumper cost me £25. I'll take a check or a credit card. It's a gift. And our salvation is a gift from God. It is, firstly, unmerited love. We could do nothing to earn it. We could never hope to please God. We could never hope to pay him for it. You see, God didn't, from heaven, look down and say, aren't those Presbyterians wonderful people? They come to church. They read their Bible. They pray. They give to the church. They do good works. Uh, Oh, box, tick, tick, tick. That makes them right with me. You know, the rich young ruler was able to say, all these have I kept from my youth. And yet Christ said to him, one thing you lack. And if we are depending this morning on our good deeds, our good works, our Bible reading, our church attendance, our church giving, we're missing the mark. It's unmerited love. It's unmeasurable love. There is no way we we were singing about that earlier on. And there is another old hymn that that's, talks about the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. And that last verse says this. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. It's unmeasurable love. Someone was once asked, how do you measure God's love? And the answer was this, Jesus Christ at the cross on Calvary stretched out his arms and he said this much it's unmeasurable it's unmerited it's unchanging sometimes you know we say we love a person our husbands our wives our children but you know we even see in the human sphere that that can be subject to change dependent on our mood but God's love isn't like that God says I've loved you with an everlasting love God's love carries on through time and onto eternity itself. Once we were strangers to the love of God, but now in and through Christ, we have been reconciled to that love and to God himself. Now he says we have all the rights and the privileges of the sons and daughters. We have been adopted When a child is adopted in in this scene of time into a family, they get a piece of paper that tells them that they are part of that family. They have the same status, the same rights as, as children born into that family. And so you and I, when we are born into the family of God, have this new status, sons and daughters of God. And so we have the 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 Lamb of God. We have the love of God. But finally, we have the life of God, our life with God. 
Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and verses 51 on, says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. When Christ comes again, this will be the experience to all those who know him and love him and wait for his appearance. Of course, the eternal life begins here and now. But Paul says when he comes again, there will be life in all its fullness. It will be instant, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Our conversion is in a moment. Our sanctification takes a lifetime, but our glorification, says Paul, will be in an instant. It will be certain. He says, and we will be changed. Whatever doubts, whatever uncertainties you have now will all be taken away. Those times when you even doubt if you're in Christ, that will all be removed in a moment. And we will be different. This mortal will be put, will put on immortality. You know, our bodies corrupt day by day. I don't have to wear the glasses because I have my notes so big uh, that I, I don't need to keep taking them on and off. But the, this eyesight's deteriorating. My wife tells me my hearing's even worse. I think that's because I don't listen. But we are decaying day by day by day. But then we will be changed this mortal will put on immortality. No more tears, no more crying, no more death. And it will be eternal. It will last forever. That's a concept that we find difficult to get our heads around. Forever. What's forever like? Well, it's forever and ever and ever. What a wonderful prospect. What a wonderful privilege awaits those in Christ Jesus. But this morning as I close, friends, I have to be true to the word of God and remind you that it's a privilege that only awaits those who are in Christ. Because you see, for others, that eternal will not be eternal life. But that eternal death of which Christ spoke, that place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It is hard for us to grasp what eternal life means, but it's even harder to grasp the, the concept of eternal death. For us, death means the end. End of life as we know it. End of life as we experience it. But Christ speaks of a death that will never end. We will die and die and die and die. Enduring the wrath of God because the, those are the wages of our sins. So this morning, friends, we have that picture. The perfect Lamb of God. The one who gave his life for my sin and your sin. The one who provides for us our justification. And then we have, secondly, the love of God. That unmerited love which makes you and I, his children, his sons and his daughters. That's our adoption into his family. And then for those who know and love him, that prospect of eternal life. One day we will experience it and be with him to, for all eternity. That's our glorification. I wonder what it is for you this morning. What is that prospect? What are you looking at? What are you beholding this morning? Do you look forward to one day beholding the face of Christ in beauty? If so, you need to trust him now. In a moment we're going to pray and then I will pronounce the benediction and then I think the, the stewards will assist you uh, as you leave the meeting house. So let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you afresh for the living word of the living God. And as we have been once more this morning, have been brought to see its realities. Help us, Heavenly Father, that we might seek you while you may be found, that we might call upon you while you are near. And so as we leave and this place and we depart the one from the other, may we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the communion and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, resting 
remaining and abiding with us each one this day and forevermore. Amen.